Who's afraid Man. of the big bad ah. wolf? Y'all scared of the big bad wolf? Clearly not Beta, as he came right in, full force to take on the big dick swinging badass himself. Little pig, little pig. I gotta tell you, I don't think I've cheered and yelled at an episode as much as I have this one in a long time. Negan got himself decked out in his classic signature leather jacket, you know, kind of like the one like this. Magic, right? He's even got himself an upgraded Lucille too. He is back to his old badass self. Or is he? This week's episode follows two storylines with a crap ton of side stuff thrown in the mix. The first of those is the whole Kelly going missing and losing her hearing and having to be found, but the majority of the comic book parallels and nods are going to be around Negan and Brandon. We're going to quickly recap the other stuff. For the first major story in this episode, Kelly gets injured while tracking a boar. When she doesn't return with the rest of the group, Daryl and Connie go searching for her and eventually find Kelly in time with a surprise appearance by Magma. A quick summary of the side quests. Back at Hilltop, the Tiger Tamer, formerly known as the King, confesses to Sadiq that he has thyroid cancer and probably won't make it to season 11. I got good news and bad news. Give it to me straight, Tads. The good news is you have a clean band of health. Oh, what a relief. The bad news is you have cancer. Jamie Lannister practices his sword skills and tries to befriend third in command Gamma, proving their communities can be compassionate and also proving that he may not be 100% gay. We also find out from that Gamma right? really hates Vermont. I'm from Vermont. Where... Supplies go missing from Hilltop, and we find out that it was tied Ruth to our main story, but not before it causes a lover's quarrel, resulting in an immediate halt to all foreseeable scissoring. Really, I don't even understand how two women can make love. I mean, un unless they just kind of scissor or something. Okay, so that should just about cover it. There really isn't that many comic book parallels or nods for these. Daryl doesn't exist, and Kelly is a large black man who doesn't lose his hearing or get lost while playing in the woods. At this point in the comics, the two are enlisted in Dwight's militia along with Magma and Yumiko, but don't seem to be too thrilled about the arrangement. Ezekiel was one of Alpha's victims, so he's been dead a long time before he had a chance to fight any cancer. Okay, seriously, three South Park cutaways in a row? That's just lazy. Lastly, Aaron didn't lose his hand in the comics. That honor was given to Rick in much earlier on. Aaron also does not lead the militia, but he is a part of it and takes temporary leave at this point to go with Michonne to track down Negan. Alrighty then, let's get to the meat and potatoes of the show. We find Plus Negan on the nine. run and Brandon is caught up to him. It's revealed here that Negan actually broke out on his own and Brandon tracked him down. So you're really not gonna tell me how you got out of that cell? He reveals that his parents were loyal saviors and Rick Grimes killed them. And it seems he's always held a resentment for the communities. He tags along with Negan, thinking he's escaping to find a new sanctuary, maybe start up the old game. During their hiking trip, Brandon reunites him with an old love. Reunited and it feels so good Doing someone that you used to do That's what this song's about The duo come across a mother and her kid out alone and Negan springs into action to save them. Brandon suggests robbing or killing them but Negan comes up with another idea and tells Brandon to go away. After Brandon leaves, Negan has a heartwarming talk with the kid and then for some reason leaves them by himself just long enough to be murdered by Brandon. Clearly Brandon didn't listen to Negan when he said never come back so he feels forced to beat some sense into him. He dons his signature leather jacket and upgrade Lucille too and then heads off to find the whispers. Okay. Long, annoying rant incoming in three, two. Seriously, this whole Brandon Negan scenario just drove me freaking insane. It's the 
Sorry, AMC. This is the laziest, dumbest writing that you guys had in a long time. I haven't seen anything this bad since the horrible CGI deer several, several seasons ago. Why would AMC have a former savior in charge of guarding the former leader of the saviors? There was nobody else in that community that could have been put over watch of Ornegan. Surely they would have known that Brandon held a big resentment for Rick Grimes killing his parents. I mean, even if he claimed and was the best actor in the whole world, nobody in the right mind would put a former savior whose parents were saviors murdered by the man who's essentially founded these communities in a way and united them and took down Negan to watch over Negan. That's stupid. It makes no sense. And I don't know why they put that in there. Secondly, how did Negan break out exactly? He's been in there for, what, five, six years, and he breaks out on his own on the one night that he's most wanted. He's wanted by the council to decide his fate. He's wanted by the communities to put him down. And somehow on the night that everyone wants a piece of him, he manages to break out with no explanation. Come on, AMC. That's just unplausibly stupid. Third, Brandon's backstory made no sense. Like I said, to put him in charge of Negan. Now, it kind of follows along with the comics in some sense that in the comics, Rick did kill one of his parents, but he was never put in charge of anything. He was just kind of a pissed off kid. And to kind of just spring this backstory out of nowhere with no buildup, nobody gives a shit about Brandon. He was in one previous episode and then the one where he kind of showed up for three seconds and that was it. Who's going to give a fuck about Brandon being killed or what he does if you have no buildup and nothing, you just kind of spring, oh, hey, guess what? He was a former savior. That's why he helped Negan. Also, how did that mom and that kid survive so long on their own? I mean, it's been, I don't know how many years, and she's like, we moved from camp to camp, and they can't even handle three or four walkers on their own, but they somehow survived for all these years without any communities or group. And being under the radar, they're still in Alexandrian territory with all these patrols and all these things going around. They're never spotted by Rick's group or any of his patrols. They're just kind of like wandering around and they're surviving on their own. Really? Okay, so we're supposed to believe that Negan somehow broke out on his own. We're supposed to believe that Negan is on some sort of quest or something. Maybe he just broke out because he didn't want to get killed. Probably not. I mean, I know the reason why he broke out, but this is what AMC is presenting. He takes Brandon along. Brandon's showing all these like big infatuations with the former saviors and how they've been and how Negan used to be and killing kids and all that stuff. He knows what kind of person Brandon really is on the inside. He tells him to buzz off. He knows he's still around. He tried to kill the mother and son and Negan leaves them alone with a threat out there. Really? Negan is one of the smartest, most cleverest guys on this show. And we're expected to believe that he's just going to leave a mom and a son who was probably going to be killed if he hadn't stopped Brandon. He's going to leave them alone with Brandon, who's now pissed off at Negan for, for some that they kind of showed. You abandoned me. He's going to leave them alone with Brandon lurking around. Give me a break. And then on top of all this, they kind of ruin Negan's character in a sense where Brandon brings up Carl and he's like, I would never kill a kid, making it seem like he has limits. But hey, let's forget about that whole scene where he was throwing bombs and mortars over at Alexandria where there's kids. And let's forget about the whole he referred to Carl as a kid because he said, I would never kill a, that kid. I would never kill a kid. And yet... He was going to bash his fucking head in before Shiva's jumped in to save the day. But hey, let's just have Negan set this bar where he won't cross and then forget about him crossing that bar several times in the past. But hey, we're going to try to make him redeem himself and make him into like an anti-hero type. And we're going to set this bar that he won't cross. And then 30 seconds later, he's going to cross it by killing Brandon. Brandon and Carl are the same age. So Brandon's a kid in his eyes too. And he's just going to go against what he adamantly stated not 10 minutes prior 
and beat the holy hell out of Brandon to death? Really? Also, speaking of Brandon and those kids, I mean, if he beat them to death with a crowbar, wouldn't there have been more damage? I mean, I know they want to not go back to like smashing somebody's skull in like they did when he beat Glenn to death, but it didn't even show it. They could have showed the aftermath and all its bloody gory. The mom had a little bruise on her head. The kid was perfectly clean like he just passed out. Maybe he took a nap and fell over or something. He didn't have a scratch on him. So what the hell did Brandon do to him? I mean, they have no problem showing Negan crack Brandon's face open with a rock, but they can't show a mother and son like in a bloody aftermath. We're just supposed to believe that he hit her once in the head with a crowbar and then kind of like pissed on the kid to kill him. And then lastly, I don't get why they had Negan kill Brandon in the first place. I mean, I know what they're going for. They wanted it to be like, Oh, Negan found this innocent mother and son and he wanted to be the good guy and Brandon killed them. So now Negan has to put Brandon down because he's rabid. Well, who made Negan or who made Brandon rabid? It was Negan's old philosophy. Negan's responsible for how Brandon is today because Brandon idolized him. He helped him get as far as he did. He packed him his stuff. He got him his jacket, his weapons. He packed food. He helped him escape. He's helping him on the run. And... He's under this delusion. He's got some sort of sickness. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not like defending the guy. The guy's an asshole. And I like how they offed him to keep it kind of like similar to did in the comics, not parallel. I just adamantly hate the way they approached it. I mean, in the comics, it was a lot more fluid. It made a lot more sense. It kind of fit the story a lot better. Negan was this of a hard ass prick. They didn't try to redeem him as hard as AMC is trying just to rip him back down. It makes no sense. Rant is over. I absolutely hated how they wrote this whole scenario with Brandon and Negan. I love that Negan escaped. I love that they kept some comic book parallels at the major key points, but I fucking hated with the passion the whole way it was written. Okay, I just had to get that off my chest. I know what you're here for. You want to know how this whole failed father-son relationship went down in the comics, right? Well, here we go. It's also right around this time in the comics that Negan breaks out, but not on his own. Just like in the show, it's Brandon who goes off with him, but it's also Brandon who breaks him out. Like AMC's version, he's also mad at Rick for killing his dad, but he's also mad at the Whispers for killing his mother. He wants to see the two groups destroy each other and comes up with a plan to make them fight. However, he knows he can't survive on his own, so he gets the one other person who hates Rick as much as he does, or at least that's what he thinks. They escape during the commotion of a caravan leaving, and when things are clear, he gives Negan his jacket back and the two head off. Rick and Michonne find out a couple hours later that Negan has escaped and determine that he must have snuck out with Maggie's group. They find out pretty quickly that Negan is probably headed to the Whispers since Rick told him everything about them. He sends Michonne and Aaron after him. Making their way to the border, Brandon starts to get on Negan's nerve with all his talking and crying. Unlike his AMC counterpart though, this Negan has no problem killing a kid as he makes the point of telling Brandon that he has a different plan on his own. He crosses into their territory but doesn't walk around screaming for them to come find him. He notices them hiding around him and tells them to come out but seems a little shocked at their skin suits being the first time he's seeing them. Right here in the comics is where the episode ends, but I'll go just a little bit further since they've already released a lot of sneak peeks into next week's episode. When they question why he's there, he plays dumb, saying he has no idea of where here is, but he's just trying to survive. That's when Beta shows up and questions whether or not he was sent there and threatens to kill him. 
Negan, again not backing down, says he's been alone for so long that he's willing to join. If it means not having to be out there alone anymore, he'll throw on a zombie skin mask and he'll go along with the group. They take his knife without a fight and lead him to the Whisperer camp. During his trip with Negan, Brandon surprises him with a handmade Lucille 2. This is a nod to two events in the comics. First, Lucille was never lost. It was confiscated by Rick and locked up in Sanctuary, only to be taken up by Dwight who wanted to make sure it never became a proverbial scepter. He eventually gives it back to Negan though during a fight with Beta. The second nod is much, much further down the timeline. Negan is exiled and alone and happens by chance to stumble upon another baseball bat and after finding some barbed wire, makes his own Lucille too. He doesn't hang on to it for too long though and uses it to help him let go of the past. So there you have it. We are over the hump and we have three episodes left of this first mid-season half, this first half of season 10. I'm telling you, next week is going to be really interesting to see with Negan and the Whispers and all that. Daryl and Carol are going to go off after him, but stay in there because when they get to episode 7, you're going to be in for a big shock. And if you want to know what that shock is, spoiler, make sure to check out my other video, What is the Fate of Alpha? So leave your thoughts and comments in the section below. If you like this video, please share it. It really helps me out. If you're feeling generous, donate my Patreon, blah, 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 all that good stuff. Until next time, keep on whispering.